the sound or the information, right. I will be through faster, by right. the way. Right, so right, right. Half an hour max. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. perfect. And I can go up to here? Or here? How far can I go? Hello, oh, that's quite loud. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for taking attention here and taking the time to listen to us, to the Bilfinger SE. And today I have, of course, a quite interesting topic, what we combined with another very interesting topic. One is sustainability regarding decarbonization, and the other one is to find talents for our nuclear industry. And both are very challenging and both are very valid to look into and to explain a little bit. Why is it so important? It is actually important to help the world and us to fulfill the Paris Agreement. If we are not having nuclear power, we will not fulfill or coming close to the Paris Agreement. That's as simple as it is. And I'm Dr. Thomas Schulz, I'm an engineer and we calculate that. It's not a political thing, especially not a moral thing. It is purely a technical issue. And for the ones who don't believe, there are a lot of scientists out in the world who calculated that, and it's actually public knowledge. But it's, of course, not, in a lot of countries, not that very attractive to bring that as a news, as a message. But fact is, without nuclear, no fulfillment of the Paris Agreement. And now let us have a little bit of view into what, what I would like to talk today about it. One is regarding the importance of our industry, nuclear industry, for the whole world. One is about to put more effort into R&D to see that nuclear, not only with fusion, the waste handling, using actually nuclear waste as a future a source for new energy, a lot of innovation is needed. And of course, it is important to recruit, to be attractive for young people to join that industry and having a career. Because without the young generation, we will not succeed, period. We will not succeed. And we see quite a lot of, especially in the Western world, quite a lot of an opinionated approach to the nuclear industry. And as an engineer, I miss in a lot of articles actually the facts and figures. And we would like to bring some facts and figures in. And the last part of it is, of course, why we as Bilfinger, as originally a German company headquartered in Germany, are so much into it because in the country where we come from, of course, we have the biggest moral resistance in the political group, not in the population, because more than 70% of the German voters are actually for nuclear power for minimum the next 10 years, which is quite interesting. So, if we look into it, we as Bilfinger said that we want to be the number one in helping our clients to be the most efficient and with that the most sustainable companies on earth. What does it mean? It actually means that we see that efficiency, what we call today to produce more with less, to make an efficient way of working, a controllable way of working in all kinds of industries will be in five to ten years actually the new wording for sustainability. When you look into the United Nations Sustainability Goals, it covers actually everything. And then we look into our industry. Give you an example. If you buy a piece of pork in a supermarket, so if you're not a vegetarian, of course, if you buy a piece of pork, you actually can dig in and figure out what the name of the pork was and who slaughtered it, which person. 
if you buy a mobile phone today, you can't figure out where actually the material is coming from. So in some parts of the industry, we are quite far and some others not. Why is it so important? It is important to get efficiency in. If you know, if you can look down the whole value chain for a product, and a product could be electrical power, then humans are actually always looking into to make it more efficient, faster, better, quicker, sus more sustainable, doing more with less, all these things. So that transition from efficiency into sustainability already started. And we want to be part of that because my company is working through all industries, what you know, no matter if it's automotive, chemical industry, food, pharma, and we do 80% of the job, what we do throughout all industries is exactly the same. We come on sites to help customers to be more efficient with maintenance, engineering, special products, turnarounds, and especially training and education of our clients and of course of our own stuff too. So let us look a little bit into facts, what we have. There's a big fact in regarding our industry that we have high emissions. This is simply not true. Because when you talk about high or low emissions, you have to compare with other industries. You can't compare against nothing because you need power. And I hope here's no one who believes that we have higher emissions than, for example, gas, oil, or coal industry. And the worst of all is lignite, by the way. And I know it, I'm a mining engineer, by the way, from that point. Second thing is that there is the belief that you can replace all existing conventional, which means fossil-based energy resources, within two to five years with renewable energy resources like wind power, um, hydro and so on. And this is not possible. This is technically not possible. Give one example, German government would like to build in the next, I think it was five years, 10,000 windmills. No way that Germany gets 10,000 windmills. There is not the capacity there's not the raw material and there is not the willingness of a lot of Germans to have a windmill in their garden. So out of that, we have to bridge from an idea until we have it, a period five to 10 years, up to 20 years. And nuclear is a possibility to do that because no matter if it's in France, Sweden, wherever we look, we have nuclear power or we start to build new ones. The big advantage of it is, of course, it's a premium industry, very innovative, very demanding, so we need bright brains to go in and further to develop and investigate. Then, of course, there is the issue with the safety on nuclear power plants, and we all have the impression of Fukushima, and we all have the impression of Chernobyl, if you are my age or older, so out of that, there is a high level of sensitivity regarding nuclear power. But when you look into the advantages, what that industry did in the last 30 years in safety, you would be surprised how safe nuclear power plants are today versus other sources. But of course, we have to handle the waste. And what is waste today is energy resource for tomorrow. Why can we say that? Because look into the value chain of the last 150 years back. What was 150, 100 years ago, waste is today primary resource for a lot of industries. And we see the same with the waste out of the nuclear industry. So it is important, no matter that we have to shelter it, and to deposit it, it is important that we have a possibility to get it out again, maybe in 50 years, maybe in 30 years, to use as another source for energy. Out of that, I would like to go on with some yeah, facts and figures. 
if we look into the need for people, for new people coming into the industry, the French industry announced that they need 10 to 15,000 employees, new employees coming into that industry because as all humans, we get older and some of us anytime would like to go for retirement, some earlier, some later. But you can imagine that with the very strong birth rates up to the mid end of the 60s, when that generation is going into retirement, then a big, big gap of workforce, competent workforce is disappearing. And we have to refill that. So out of that, the need for talent, the need for education, the need for adding competences in the industry is unbelievably important. It's not possible to run the industry without people. We all know that. As I said, on the one side, we have a kind of a, yeah, opinion, very often out of media politics, which is slightly negative. And on the other side, we have a big demand for the energy and we have a big demand, very big demand for young, new talents in it. So we in our company decided that we will spend each year more additionally, more than 0.5% of our turnover only for internal training and education, which is for a 5 billion euro company, quite a lot of money. Why are we doing that? Because we get motivated people on board, but we see less and less specialized training and education out in the field, out in the schools, and very often universities too, to specialize more because we need specialists. So the industry has to take a bigger stake in educating and training and developing the talent pool further. If we then look into the CO2, and now big figures are coming, and it is actually a little bit difficult to compare, because when you look into anything what is on Earth, you have to look into what is the CO2 footprint. I'll give an example, which is not nuclear industry. Um, who here in the group has an electrical car? One, two, oh. That's less than uh, actually the average. So I don't have an elect electrical car too. The um, electrical car in Norway is definitely the most CO2 friendly vehicle what you can have. Because in Norway, most of the electrical power is renewable energy, comes out of hydropower for more than 100 years. Then when you have an electrical car in Germany, it is actually a diesel engine car, a combustion diesel engine car, more CO2 friendly than an electrical car. Because most of the energy in Germany comes out of lignite, and then coal, and then gas and oil, and then if France is so nice to give us some of the energy, up to 20% French atomic power. So, the electrical car in Germany is actually not the most CO2 friendly, but everyone thinks it is because the people don't know a, the, the energy mix and B, how much it costs. And cost means how much CO2 is produced to produce the car. And as a mining engineer, if you have ever a possibility to go to a lithium um, mine site, do that. And if you think that's environmental friendly, okay. So when we look into it, the nuclear industry with its very low CO2 footprint, footprint is a big contributor to reduce CO2. That's a fact. And if the president here in France says we have pink hydrogen, which means hydrogen built on nuclear power, then he is completely right when he says this is one of the most CO2-friendly possibilities to get good and efficient, cost-efficient hydrogen. If we look into 
the um, comparison, you see here on the upper side, 800 times more CO2 friendly versus coal firing. 400 times more CO2 friendly versus gas. And these are facts, again, you can calculate. It's actually not so difficult when you calculate the ton of CO2 produced by oil, gas, lignite, coal firing, or nuclear firing. Then, when we look into the amount of CO2, what nuclear reduced as a CO2 footprint to avoid CO2 in the last 60 years, it's unbelievable a lot. It's huge. It's huge. We say it's more than 60 gigaton. Actually, if you add in all the cost to build coal firing places, as well as the mine sites and so on, actually that figure goes up. That figure goes significantly up. Because the big difference with a nuclear power plant lies in the way how the resources are built and the installations for it. On the other side, when we look into European Union, then we have an offering rate, a demand and a utilization rate in the whole energy mix around, let's say, 25% of the total. Again, I like to take, of course, Germany because they are the government is the most negative on nuclear. They say we are out of nuclear. We had three weeks ago the highest ever utilization of nuclear in the German energy mix. Higher than it was than we, when Germany had their own nuclear power plants. Of course, no one tells that the people. But the fact is, it was 24% of the total energy mix. So out of that, the importance of nuclear is clear. Why I'm saying that all, it's actually not to make advertising for our company, it's actually more for advertising for young talents. Because when we look into the biggest threat, what we see for our industry, is the lack of getting enough young people into that industry. When we look around what the average age is in the industry, it is actually a little bit better than you have it in the chemical industry, a little bit better than you have it in the construction industry, but still too old, over 40 years. And when we get the hit of the retirement of the baby boomers, we all will get a huge problem to have enough people working in the industry. And we see it already today in the blue color part. The lack of competent blue color employees in Western Europe is unbelievable high. You heard that, you see that, we see it each day. We have alone in our company 22,000 blue color people and we try to attract them and of course, a lot of younger people don't want to work any longer in that way as two or one generation ago the people worked. So we have to explain to people more what is it, what we need as labor in the industry and what are the chances and the possibilities to have a career, no matter if you are white color or blue color. Especially the nuclear industry with the huge demand in the future to deliver energy with the huge demand to be more sustainable and being a big contributor into it, with a huge demand with that tsunami of regulation out of Brussels, combined with that, yeah, partly complicated technology, is a fantastic field to have a career in the future. It's a fantastic field to have a career. And I can actually give in that one example out of myself. When I started uh, to study, that was in the mid-end of the 80s, I decided to study mining. We had in Aachen 400 seats for students and we were 18. 18 starter. When I was done with my study, from the 18, only 12 were left. Only 12 finalized it. And we had a loan in the German mining industry, which is very tiny, not a big industry, 70 open positions, 7-0. Seven 
that is what we see. If you go into nuclear, if you find your career there, it is a hell of a good industry to have a good career. You can go around the world, it is very attractive, and it's very demanding too, but it's very attractive. And as you see it here on that exhibition, it's actually quite a small family throughout the world, which makes life quite interesting and nice too. Because after several years, you get to know each and every one, and it's a little bit like homecoming, which helps too. So out of that, I would like to look into other things beside that with the nuclear industry regarding innovation. What is it to look ahead? What we call today nuclear, tomorrow then the energy supply industry, non-fossil based energy supply industry, if it's fusion, if it's the small localized nuclear power plants, there are a lot of ideas. And we see in the last few years with more and more startups coming that more and more good ideas are popping up in that industry. It just began out of that, what we have with the energy crisis in the last three, four years, actually starting with the financial crisis more than 10 years ago, or actually 14 years ago, that the need for new technologies is very high. And new technology is not only windmills. I guarantee you that. New technology has to be sustainable in a way that you can deliver it wherever you need that for cost-efficient purpose and at the same time that you can regulate it. You don't need to wait until the wind blows. You can run a nuclear power, any power plant, up and down, and with that regulating the demand, which is unbelievably important in the future, more than today, especially when we look into the climate change and with the risk of flooding, storm, whatever, especially heat. So, if we then go on, what is it what we need in the industries? We, it's not only that we need the top-notch engineers. We actually need a lot of different competences. Physics, mathematics, economy, whatever you can imagine. That industry, when we look around in Europe, it's more or less not one country saying they don't want to have a new nuclear power plant. We have a real revival of the industry. And we know that the revival of the nuclear industry goes for decades. And as I said, we don't see that we have enough people for that, what is actually planned. And then the question is how to realize it. We can realize it on our own or someone else will realize it for us. I prefer the first way. So out of that, it is an important industry. It is good to go in. And if we have younger people here in the auditorium, this is really a good career path. So, with the presentation, I would like to finalize more or less the presentation a little bit with own things, what we have. We as Bilfinger have roughly 800 to 1,000 people already working in the nuclear industry, actually all over Europe, starting now to work in US and in the Middle East too to make that industry for us as a component bigger. And we calculated which kind of CO2 we save with our activities, not only in nuclear, but that figure is for nuclear only. We actually do that for each and every little thing what we do to our clients. No matter if it's scaffolding, engineering, turnaround, we can calculate it in tons of CO2 saved. And we believe in a few years, customers will ask more, for example, in the high energy industry like chemical industry, they will ask more for sustainability improvement and then calculating how much do I have to pay for one kilogram of CO2 less, instead of asking how much does that engineering part cost me. 
We see that already in the oil and gas industry happening, where customers approach us and saying, this is our sustainability footprint in, on that site, on that offshore platform. What can you offer us to reduce the sustainability footprint? And how much does it cost? That way of calculating and working, you will see in five to 10 years as the absolute standard. So out of that, any questions? Comments, questions, anyone of different opinion, please. So you spoke about the German home market and nuclear power and the reluctance of the current government. How do you see that going in the next five or 10 years? In, in German language, if you had a nice party or so and you leave, then you say um, Auf Wiedersehen, which means see you again. And that is actually the theme for the German nuclear industry. See you again. It will come back. That's a given. It actually came back because we get so much nuclear energy out of France. It's already there. But they will restart. Other questions? I have to give you the microphone, otherwise... With the uh, international markets being so volatile all over the world currently with what's going on, how do you see the next 10 years with the nuclear industry being affected by any political shift or any economic shift in landscape due to conflicts and other unforeseen circumstances that we can't see right now? That's a very good question. The, it, it is in the interest of governments to have a minimum level of independence in energy supply. When you look into Europe, what is it, what you can do beside nuclear? Coal, too expensive because it's underground. Lignite, from a sustainability point of view, the absolute horror. Hydro, we are so big populated in Europe, it's very difficult to put a lot of hydro plants, power plants into place. What else then? They are, of course, renewable in, uh, energy like wind and sun, which, which is okay, but there's not always enough wind and there's not always enough sun. So you need batteries in between. And a nuclear power plant is supplying the energy and being a battery because you can run it up and down. So out of that, we see like Belgium extended, we see the Swedes now want to build more and it, it, Poland, big coal industry, they want to build. They do that to be in, more independent because if you are not independent, as we saw with the Ukraine war, where countries like Italy, Germany, and so on got most of the gas from one country, Russia, you are actually under the thumb of these other countries, and you don't like that. Then we look to the supply side, uranium and so on. As um, I saw that in an article, there's not enough uranium available. This is not true. This is a lie. There's a lot of uh, uranium available, and Russia is not the main supplier. The main supplier today is Kazakhstan. So by the way, and big suppliers could be US and Australia, but they don't supply so much because there was not so much demand. Now, when the demand is there, which means the price goes up, then it makes more sense to build up, to reopen mine sites in these areas too. So from a political point of view, with that high volatility, what we see since the financial crisis, the volatility is very high, more and more countries are looking to be more independent in the supply side. Then Corona came in and we supply into the pharmaceutical industry. And what we see is that the pharmaceutical industry is localizing supply chain. Instead of having one big factory for a medicine for the whole world, they built on each continent smaller factories. Why? To be independent against political unrest or change in weather conditions. And what's 
other things to be more independent. So from our point of view, and our point of view is not only Bill Finger, it's a lot of people looking into that, how the world will emerge. The nuclear industry has clearly a revival. Any other question? Uh, I have a question. Um, Billfinger is a very cons constructi uh, constructing uh, business, so people need to go on site, they need to travel from site to site. Now we have a trend in the more younger generation, you know, ways of working change, so people, um, they, uh, it's more important uh, the way that they live, work-life balance, mobile working and so on. There's basically something that is a little difficult to be realized in this industry. Do you see this trend affects you? And uh, if yes, what do you do to make this more attractive for young people? The, actually, we were a construction company up to 2012. Then we sold that off. Today we are predominantly in engineering and in industrial service. And most of our people are working for decades on the same side. So we have not that big demand to, to, be, uh, to move around. But, the, you know, I lived in Chile, North America, Denmark, Sweden, Belgium, Netherlands, Singapore and China. And Germany, not to forget. And Germany. So I went around the world. The, if you would like to have a career, to go around the world is, of course, very helpful. And it makes so much fun. Because you meet so many good things and different cultures and people. And the world is not so different as we always see it on TV, by the way. So food can be very much different. Don't eat Schusträuming in Sweden. I, rotten fish. Anyone knows rotten fish in Sweden? Don't do it. Don't open the can in the house. You never get rid of that smell. Nevertheless, the, the mobilizing the younger generation is more difficult than it was before because it's not that attractive any longer and it has a little bit to do with safety and the political stress because it's more dangerous. But we have digitalization, artificial intelligence. You don't need to travel so much. You actually can sit anywhere in the world and doing business on the other part. We do that each day with video conferencing and so on. And the world in the last 10, 15 years dramatically changed. And the main reason for that is that sensors got so cheap. When I started with my career at the beginning of the, let's say, 90s, to have one vibration sensor cost roughly 1,000, yeah, 500 euro. Today you get it for half a euro. So it's actually not a lot of cost any longer. So to have digital approach, sitting anywhere in the world and doing the job anywhere else is get more and more common, which will help that younger generation. But you still need the people to believe that artificial intelligence takes everything over will not happen. Will not happen. How many minutes do I have? No, it's over. <laughs> like no minutes. Five minutes you. ago. So if you have other questions, it's going to be. Ah, in we the can small go over room. to the. Yes. Yeah. And they have coffee. Yes. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. a lot, guys. Really. Thanks. <laughs>